second half of Acts chapter 12. Um, my neighbor is using a nail gun <laughs> at this time and um, I you can actually hear it from inside my apartment so I thought at least if we record outside you can also hear the birds. Um, so please take a second and um, just enjoy this piece of writing that was written by me, the Robins, and my neighbor's nail gun. I have known Herods in my life. I have known bullies who have looked past me, made me small for their own glory, dismissed me, criticized me, found me lacking. No matter what I sacrificed, my heart, my body, my hopes, my best efforts, all were found wanting, offered to this mashed up tyrant of playground politics, high school dances, and women in skincare commercials. I begged this voice to give me the identity I so craved, desperate to win the approval of those who had first thought so little of me, suffocating in my dictated smallness. But God's love has the jaws of a terrier, and when I gasped out for truth, they sunk in and didn't let go as much as I tried to shake them. He never thought little of me. My adoption happened before I was born, before I did anything that would have validated my worth. 
My identity cannot be gained from any abuse to my body or scars on my heart earned by blistered hands or bloody offerings. That burden was carried for me already. The tyrants and the bullies and the Herods of this world have no power over who I am, no authority to name me unworthy. Their voices still call to me on lonely nights, but they sound empty and desperate. I have taken their measure and found them lacking. Well, good afternoon, Eucharist. I don't know what the weather is like when we're all watching this live, but today it was raining all day and now it is beautiful sunshine. And uh, I got the greatest gift to my soul today. I got to see a bunch of people from our church in the building together and it was just like soul food. <laughs> a bunch of people in our church came by today to pick up uh, the prints that we were selling off that Jamie Miller did of the building. And it was just like, so nice. Everyone that walked in was like, oh, I've missed the musty smell of the sanctuary. It's so nice to be back here. And it just makes me remember that someday we're going to get to join together in person again. I don't know if it'll be like all of us at once or how that'll go, but we're going to get to worship together. We're going to get to be together to sing and to receive communion, probably not by intention for a very long time. Uh, but also to hear stories from each of them that came by today about how they are being the church in their home at this time. And so I'm encouraged by that. And uh, I'm so glad for everyone who's engaging in Rhythms of Life together. If you want to do that, check out the website. The details are there uh, with our weekly check-in. Got to meet with a bunch of people on Wednesday night to talk about that. But then just the other ways also that people are being the church, the organic stories of people taking care of each other and blessing each other and prayer walking their neighborhood and uh, going to work with purpose and intention and, and bringing dignity and value and love with them everywhere they go. I love this community. And I'm so encouraged to hear all of that and uh, hope that if we haven't gotten to connect, we can connect soon because I just want to hear more of what God's doing in this community kind of while we're scattered all over. So be encouraged. And I hope that you are also finding that as you connect with people, you're hearing good news of what God is still doing in this time of social isolation. We are back in the book of Acts. If you didn't watch the last couple weeks or listen to the weekly teaching from them, you, uh, you're going to be behind, and since we're watching this live, you're kind of stuck with it, but go back uh, if you haven't, you know, get back and listen to the uh, last two weeks, because we're in the book of Acts, and it is increasingly relevant to our modern life, but it's also the story of the early church, and this week has a story that I think is particularly interesting. One of the things I love about having a kid is that uh, we are now at the point in her life where we're reading the Bible together after dinner. We use the Jesus Storybook Bible which many of you in our church should have, because if you dedicated your kids in Eucharist, you get one. Uh, if you don't have one, it's because I forgot, and just shoot me a message, we'll get you one. Um, but we're reading that Jesus Storybook Bible with Clementine every day after dinner. And it gets you thinking very quickly, like, how do you decide, if you're the editor of that book, which stories go in and which ones don't? And what I've been struck by as we go through the book of Acts is how few stories from Acts make it into those children's storybook Bibles. It seems like the book of Acts is like Jesus ascended. Maybe you get that story. Uh, the Holy Spirit came like fire and tongues of fire. We get that one. Uh, Saul got knocked off his horse and became Paul. We get that one. And then after chapter like eight, it's like, and then some other stuff. But there's so much more in the book of Acts. This is like the story of the early church. And the church has spent so much time in the epistles, the letters of the New Testament, which are beautiful and brilliant and have their own narrative elements. But we've often missed this book of Acts. And I keep wondering, why? Why do we miss it? And then I get to texts like this week's text, and I go, oh, that's why we don't read the book of Acts a lot, because it is weird. So I love this week's text. I can't wait to uh, surface a few things for you all in it. This will be the Sunday service teaching, the sermon, uh, but then at four o'clock on this channel and on uh, the Eucharist Church podcast, we'll put up not only the sermon, but then this week's teaching as well, which we'll get into a couple of details that I don't have time to get into if I'm going to keep this teaching to 10-15 minutes. So open up your Bibles, if you've got one, to Acts chapter 12. We are in verse... 18, verse 18, and we're going to go down to uh, verse 24. 
So open that up. And I have a couple of readers this week who are going to read that text for us. So I'll pass it over. Hello, everyone. This is Cindy here. Hi, this is Brian Craig. Hi, I'm uh, Lauren McLeod. Coming to you from my backyard. I'm currently at home on maternity leave. I'm lucky I get to hang out with our 10-month little guy every day. I'm partly retired, so this time has not been as much of a change for me as it is for many of you. Um, the last five or six weeks for us have looked very different. Um, even though it's a bit rainy today, I do try to spend a bit of time outside every day. We're used to being out and busy in the community. The fresh air and the beautiful things budding and creation coming out is just really helpful to see in the midst of all of this physical distancing. Um, I'm spending a fair amount of my time trying to figure out how to put a doctor of ministry course online that was supposed to be a one week in class residency. And we've been at home a lot, spending time um, enjoying nature, going on walks, spending time in our backyard. And I'm spending a fair amount of time missing my grandkids. Hi, Georgia and Sam. It's been a tough adjustment for our little one, um, for my husband, but we're taking this time to reflect and be grateful uh, for the Eucharist community, um, for friends and for family. I'm going to share the text for today. Reading from Acts 12, verses 18 to 23. When morning came, there were no small commotion among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and could not find him, he examined the guards and ordered them to be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they came to him in a body, and after winning over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for a reconciliation, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat on the platform, and delivered a public address to them. The people kept shouting, the voice of God and not of a mortal. And immediately, because he had not given the glory to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to advance and gain adherence. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can see why this text isn't on your Sunday school felt boards. <laughs> A little Herod and ah, angel of death. Uh, so what's going on here? Okay, a couple of things. First off, there's a continuation of the story from the famine. Herod's land was next to these other lands that send embassies to say, hey, we need food. And we were talking a couple of weeks ago about how famines were always class famines. So Herod likely had storehouses of wheat and grain, but he's using his power here to make these other countries and their people that they're sending beg for help. He's probably working backroom deals. He's using this famine as an opportunity to gain power and control and in order to assert his dominance over the neighboring nations. We've just seen Herod in prison, Peter. He executed James, one of the 12. He's persecuting the church. And now we see his foreign policy uh, it's very much Herod and Herod's people first, not to make any too strong allusions. <laughs> we also hear about him going out then at this big festival, which would have been one of the big festivals celebrating the Roman life um, and in honor of the emperor. We'll get into that in the weekly teaching. And he wears these royal robes. And for the, that, you'll also have to hear about the teaching, but they're these like shiny silvery robes. <laughs> they have descriptions of them from this historian named Josephus. And he also tells us that this is actually accurate. It would have been about four months after the story we have with Peter, most likely, um, that, that Herod was immediately struck with stomach pains. And he saw this bird that he thought was a bad omen. And then he went off and he said, I'm going to die. And then he died. So we actually, this is one of the rare cases where we have uh, historians outside of the biblical canon writing, as well as historians within the biblical canon. And uh, then there's that great detail that he was eaten by the worms, which you can explain to your children who are listening. They'll love that detail. Kids like weird stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> but it does make me ask, why was this story passed down from generation to generation to generation? Luke is hunting for stories. Luke, the author of Acts. He's already written his Gospel of Luke with the stories of Jesus. Now he's writing the follow-up of the early church. He would have been given stories from everyone he met. He would have had access to so much information 
And yet, for some reason, this detail makes the cut. Like papyrus that he's writing on would have been expensive. Ink would have been expensive. People didn't write these kind of things down casually. He chose to make this story part of the cut. And then that was passed down and became part of the canonized uh, the canonization of scripture from the early church, who said these are the inspired words of the Holy Spirit. And now billions of people around the world have found meaning in the book of Acts, and including this very strange story of Herod being struck dead. Why? Why did the Holy Spirit inspire the authors of scripture to write, record, and canonize this particular story in Acts? But of course, this is probably one of those times where we miss why it happens. We miss this because we, Canadians, have it pretty good. We aren't used to military tyrants. We aren't used to the powerful in such an obvious way using their power over those who are weak. But millions of people reading this story across the world today, and certainly throughout history, would read this story of Herod's death and know immediately exactly why it was put in the canon. Refugees fleeing their homes, those who have been under unjust governments, the slaves of the ancient world and the modern world, maybe for the first time now many Americans are finding the same thing to be relevant in this. We are very lucky that we've not had to deal with true abuse of power in the same way that many have. But for millions and millions across the world, the story of an unjust tyrant who has been ruling with an iron fist, who has been abusing the people under him, who has been using famine as an opportunity for personal gain and power, for millions of people, the idea that God would intervene and strike him down, and take life from the one who claimed he could take life. Herod claimed to be here like a god. The people yell out the voice of a god and not of a mortal, and Herod doesn't stop them, even though he would have been a Jewish man who should know better than this. Herod has been playing God, taking life when only God can give and take life, imprisoning to silence, gaining money and power and influence. And here God does what so many of us and so many people certainly throughout the world and throughout time would want to have happen. That in time, justice would strike down for a moment and properly judge the wickedness of a wicked man. Why is this in the canon? Because it's important for so many people, for so much of human history. And this comes then with a warning a very strong warning. It should be scary. Most of us aren't fans of the idea of a violent God. <laughs> and there are good reasons for that. And God is certainly not violent in the way that people are violent. And in Christ, we see the truest face of God. But here we have another side of God who is a holy God, who when he appears, burns up all false gods. And so this is a warning. Do not play God. Do not play those power games. If we want to get more into judgment, hell, God's uh, wrath, we're going to get into that in the weekly teaching, which now I know you want to <laughs> look into. But here all I want to say is that we actually do want God to step in and judge those who are playing God in a way that is leading to the dehumanization of the weak and the vulnerable. And this is then good news. This story is really good news to those on the underside of power. And it's a warning to those with power. It does what all good prophetic work should do, all good protest, all good art. It comforts the afflicted, and it afflicts the comfortable. And so today, what do we do with this text? I think there's something relevant in the fact that evil can seem so mighty, and despair can seem so great, but it is only for a time. That wickedness burns bright, but it burns out quickly. And then this is a reminder to us 
to not give in to that false power that dehumanizes, that tries to get us on its side, to not give in to the bullies of the world, because though they may have power right now, their time will soon be up. Oh, that's such good news. Their time will soon be up, and they will fall. There's a fascinating detail in this text that I just love. The text keeps calling Herod, Herod, but that's not his only name. This is Herod Agrippa. I might be pronouncing that wrong, all you, you know, Aramaic scholars out there, but I think it's Agrippa. I know the spelling. Um, And Herod Agrippa was just one of three Herods in the Bible. So you might be familiar with that name, Herod. He shows up a bunch. At the birth of Jesus, it is Herod, this is Herod the Great, who massacred the innocents trying to kill Jesus because he was afraid his throne would be taken by a child. And so he acts wickedly. Then there's another Herod, a descendant of Herod the Great, and he's the Herod that Jesus would have interacted with in his lifetime. He's the one looking for Jesus. He's the one who, when John the Baptist calls him out on the ways that he's acting, has John the Baptist thrown in prison and ultimately has him beheaded. And now we have a third Herod, Herod Agrippa, who is the ruler over Israel at this time, working under the Romans. And he, like the Herods before, uses his power to act violently towards those who he wishes to silence. And I think the reason, potentially, this is just a theory that some people have, but but I think it rings true. Josephus, this historian, Jewish historian, uses the name Agrippa when he introduces the story of Herod. But here in Acts, we don't get that title, we just get Herod. And I wonder if Luke's not implying that this isn't just a judgment on one Herod. This isn't one person acting poorly or one person who is corrupt. But this is the entire structure of the Herods, of power being handed down from generation to generation, of all these Herods acting the same way, being insecure, being afraid, and ultimately lashing out to control the situation with violence. I wonder if here the reason that Luke uses the title Herod is to say this isn't about one man getting what's due, but this is about the entire structure, the system, the power and principality of what Herod represents being judged a moment in time where that is knocked down and decisively struck down as if to say it is not just one man who's become corrupt, but this entire position has become corrupt and God has judged its wickedness. The book of Acts involves so much critiquing of structures and systems and powers and principalities. We in the West are so used to thinking about one person, one man who's not acting well, but it is always tied and acts to broader religious, political, socioeconomic structures that lead to corruption and idolatry and playing God. Evil, we are told in this story, will not last. The church might have been tempted here to buddy up next to Herod, After being persecuted, having their people thrown in prison, they might have thought that maybe they should try to get on Herod's good side and they should try to go to Herod's dinner parties and they should try to get Herod to, you know, stand up for the church instead of persecuting them. But just four months later, he's knocked dead and the worms eat him. Rome ultimately will fall. All empires fall. The West will fall. And so there's a warning here to the church. Don't get too cozy. Don't make a friend with the bullies and the tyrants. They will fall like lightning. Their reign and their abuse of power is temporary. And this ties into a biblical theme then that's much bigger, which is that all suffering is temporary. As followers of Jesus, we're never told to fight back. We're not allowed to use violence against even uh, violence against even violent people. But we are told to endure suffering, to allow it to build character and hope inside of us. And we are told to not take a present moment perspective on time, but to stretch it out and to take the long view on history. So we've been scattered for a couple of months. We're sitting in our homes watching this YouTube video. I'm one of you right now watching myself talk. We feel disconnected. We feel alone. We feel isolated. And maybe we feel like this is the way it's going to be forever. The early church might have felt that sitting under Herod, and then boom, in a moment, everything changes. We are just in a moment. We need to take a long view of history as well and understand the final verse of the section that we read. Verse 24, after talking about the worms eating him, Luke writes, but the word of God continued to advance 
and gain adherence. We are called to a different view of time. The word of God, that means the message of God, the statement, the power in his words. This is the word of mercy and justice, of love and mutuality and sacrifice, of worship and of prayer and of service. It is the news that there has been and will be resurrection, and all the kings of the world can try to crush that out, and they can play their power games, and they can pull out their swords, but the word of God will continue to move forward slowly and quietly and below the surface, subversively. It will move, and it will grow, and it will spread like yeast through dough, or like a tiny seed that produces the largest tree. It will endure, and it will outlive every empire. And so, church, do not be discouraged. We are part of the slow-coming kingdom that is already at work, that has been growing for 2,000 years, that pivoted all of reality in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and still continues to grow. Do not be discouraged. Be hopeful. Put your hope in that slow coming kingdom. And in our slow growing kingdom, the word of God spreading, there will be moments of victory, Peter at the gate celebrating. There will be moments of deep grief, James is executed and beheaded. There will be moments of revelation, Herod is struck down dead, and we all see how temporary his power was. But in all seasons, endure, keep the faith. Watch the good word spread in our church, in our city, and in our homes. Grace and peace, Eucharist Church. Hi, everyone. We are going to take some time now for prayers of the people. And this means that over the course of the week, members of our community have sent in um, their prayers, and I will read through them. Together, we will pray them. Um, And at the end of each prayer, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond with me, hear our prayer. So before I get into reading through the prayers and we get through, um, get to praying these together, I invite you to just take a moment of silence. We'll just quiet ourselves, um, and then I'll begin reading our first prayer. Let's pray. My sister has been taken to hospital because she's been having difficulty breathing. She's been tested for COVID-19 and her husband and two little ones are self-isolating at home. Please pray for healing for her lungs and her body. Please pray for the doctors and nurses caring for her, that they would have the resources available to help her get better. Please pray for her husband as he tries to help the kids understand why their mom is in the hospital. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the churches in our True City uh, family, who in their own unique ways are trying to meet the needs of their congregation, as well as come up with creative ways to engage on Sundays. Not everyone has the ability to engage using the internet, and this makes uh, this time hard for congregants and leadership teams alike. A few churches have lost congregants during this time and are finding it impossibly hard to not be able to be near these families, to take, um, to take of them and to hold them. God, we know you are close to us in our grief. Please sustain us as we wait in hopeful anticipation for the time we can gather together again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Maria prays, knowing that my clients at work may not be getting what they need right now is brutal. Please bring us the clients that might be slipping through the cracks. Thank you that during this weird and sad time, I've gotten to connect with clients more than I usually do, that I've had the time to chat and really hear how they're doing. Please be near to the lonely ones, the ones whose surgeries are canceled, the ones who aren't going to treatment because they can't find a way to get there, and to the single mom with seven kids going through chemo whose positive spirit was awe-inspiring. Lord, in your mercy. 
hear our prayer. I thought I had a good handle on the stress of all this social isolation and inability to fix things. I'm an Enneagram 8 and it's hard to not be able to control a virus. Turns out my stress is just coming out in unexpected ways. I'm more irritable than usual and bothered by things that I normally wouldn't be, like work problems I can't solve and coworkers who don't deserve my venting. I guess just pray for me and everyone in our community who are dealing with uncharted, uncharted territory for their interactions, relationships, and mental health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, thank you for the small things in this time. For tea, for friends on sidewalks, spots of sun and birds everywhere. Help us to continue to see the ordinary blessings around us, even in times of trial and uncertainty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uh, some of you may remember um, our friend Sean had sent in some prayers for his nephew who is in sick kids, so he's just provided an update and a prayer. Um, he says, after one month, my nephew has been transferred out of the ICU at SickKids and into his own room, making it easier for my family to be comfortable as they visit with him. It looks like he will be there for one more week as they continue to monitor him and his progress, but he kept down his first few bottles of food on his own without, a, without use of a feeding tube. So we praise God for that. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please pray for my friend who's supposed to get married in July. It's out of province for most guests and has been so stressful for the couple as they wait for more info, re-gathering and regulations and whether or not they will be able to host the wedding that they've planned. It's a small thing in our hurting world, but it still matters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all the dreams and ideas and projects that aren't getting off the ground right now due to this virus and for all of the people who are feeling stuck. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are mourning and grieving, particularly those in Nova Scotia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer from Emma. Pray that I get some sleep. I've never struggled with insomnia be before, but pandemic Emma doesn't sleep and I'm slowly losing it. Some nights are okay and some nights are just terrible. It's hard to be myself when I'm so tired and even harder to be the patient, gracious parent that I want to be when I'm just trying to stay awake throughout the day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we thank you for a community that can rely on one another and lean on one another um, when circumstances are difficult and uncertain. So we thank you and we praise you for our Eucharist family um, and the willingness and vulnerability to share with one another. And we lift these prayers to you and we trust that you know us and that you are attending to us, Lord, and that you are involved in responding to us um, and we also just lift the prayers to you that are unspoken and that are in our minds and in our hearts and we pray in particular for those who don't feel as though they have this kind of community who feel isolated and alone god that you would speak to them in the silence of their hearts uh, even if other communities um, or people can't reach them and lord that you would as we pray each week just be empowering us and enabling us to understand uh, what it means to be the body of Christ and to live that way um, during these circumstances and always. We surrender this coming week to you, Lord, and we just ask that you be present to us and be speaking to us in ways that we notice and can be encouraged by. And pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Ooh, location change. Uh, so a couple of quick updates before we move into communion. Uh, if you've got bread, juice, wine at your house, maybe send somebody off to get that now. Um, just two announcements. First up, if you are interested in practicing rhythms for the church in your home, we have a number of people in our church who are taking part in some common rhythms. These are six things that we're trying to do every week and none of us did them all. It is no guilt, uh, low bar in many ways, but it is a way to be a little intentional about 
uh, the rhythms of life that we have in this time of social distancing and ways to, as we talked about last week, bring the church into our homes. So if you want to learn more about that, just go to eucharistchurch.ca and there's a little box you can check there that will get an email to you. And on Wednesday night at 8 p.m., we'll have a Zoom call with anyone who wants to engage in those rhythms, who wants to talk about it together, and it's a really nice check-in. So those are the rhythms. If you want to be a part of that, just go to the website. And the website's got all the info of what's going on right now, uh, trying to keep it updated with just the most relevant information. So go check that out. The other thing is that next week uh, after church, we're going to have our first digital potluck, which will be much less delicious than normal, but it'll still be nice to see people's faces. So what we'll do next week is after the service ends around four, we'll have an hour long break. And then at 5 p.m., we're going to invite everyone to jump onto a Zoom call and we'll break you off into rooms. If you're newer to Eucharist and maybe you don't know as many people, we're going to have a table for just people who are newer to our church or people that are jumping in in this online season. And that's a great way just to do a little bit of connection. It's not quite a potluck, but it's the best we got and it's something. So that'll be next Sunday, not the first Sunday of the month. In this case, it'll be the second Sunday of the month next week, but we'll do that next Sunday after the service online. And I'd love to have you there and to get to connect and see you all uh, in your little Zoom screens. And all that will be on the website as well. So with that, let's move into a time of communion. Thanks, Glenn. So on the night that he was betrayed, Christ took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do you want to hold this for a sec? Thanks. And in the same way, he took a cup of wine and he said, this cup is my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so for thousands of years, followers of Jesus have gathered, sometimes in homes and cathedrals, sometimes underground uh, in small, small gatherings, and sometimes even isolated. But they've gathered together to receive this bread, receive this cup, and remember the life of Christ that they've been called into together. So take your bread, take the cup, dip the bread into the cup. Thank can you. I have you? Yeah, you can help me, come on. Break the bread, dip it into the cup, and remember Christ's death, resurrection, and life for you. Here you go, Mom, do you want me to dip it for you? See, here, you can have this. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can I buy a quick for you, Dad? Thank you, honey. Church in your home can be kind of nice. No, I will break it for Mama. So I invite you, wherever you are, to take a posture of reception and to receive this in sort of a physical expression, to receive this blessing um, from Scripture, from God, to you, to I, as we head out into this week to be the church in our homes and neighborhoods. So beloved of Christ, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Depart in peace and in great joy. Amen.